This is the video for Chapter 1, Introduction to Statistics. And here are the sections that we're going to cover in this video. The first section is Review and Preview. Section 2 is Statistical Thinking. Section 3 is about types of data. Section 4 is Critical Thinking. And Section 5 deals with Design of Experiments. So the first section is a Review and Preview. And this just talks about the basic idea for this chapter. So when we do studies, surveys, and collect data in other ways, what we're trying to do is get data from a small part of a larger group so that we can learn something about the larger group. Most of the time, it's not cost or time effective to study an entire group. For instance, if we wanted to know something about adults in the United States, there would be no way that we could survey or study every adult in the United States. So we have to take a smaller part of that group in order to find something out about the larger group. So in this section, we will look at some of the ways to describe data. When we talk about data, we mean observations, things like measurements, characteristics that we can see about a group, and survey responses. The definition of statistics is that it's a collection of methods for planning studies and experiments, obtaining data, and then organizing, summarizing, presenting, analyzing, interpreting, and drawing conclusions based on the data. And the whole subject of statistics is mostly about using sample data, which is from a smaller group, to make inferences or generalizations about an entire population, which would be the larger group. So when we talk about a population in statistics, this doesn't necessarily mean people. It's just a complete collection of all elements that we want to study. So this could be something like test scores, it could be people, or it could be a whole set of measurements. But when we talk about a sample, that's going to be a subset of the population. So a smaller part of the larger group that we select from the population, or that we select from the larger group. Now sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between populations and samples. So here are some key concepts to identify what a population is and what a sample is. If we're doing a poll or a survey, the sample is the set of all of those that were surveyed, not just those with a specific characteristic or answer. For example, if 200 students out of 500 surveyed answered yes to the survey question, the sample would be all of the 500 that were surveyed, not just the 200 that answered yes. Now the population is always going to be a larger group than the sample. Again, the population is the whole set of elements, people, scores, whatever, that we're interested in. Now if the sample is chosen from a group with very specific characteristics, then the sample can only represent a population with those same characteristics. What this means is that if we select our sample based on specific criteria, for example, if we select only from males in the population, or if we select only test scores from statistics students, then our sample can only represent that same group from which we selected. So it has to have the same characteristics. If we selected a sample from only the males of the population, then our sample is only going to represent males in the population. Here's an example. If a sample is selected from US citizens, then the population represented by the sample is only all US citizens. It's not all people in the US. Here's another example. A Nielsen television survey of 4,000 households in the United States finds that 2,988 of them watched the final episode of American Idol. The sample would be all of the 4,000 household surveys. And notice that this includes all of those surveyed, not just the ones that watched American Idol. The population represented by this sample is all households in the United States. And notice that it doesn't rep represent all people in the United States. In this case, our population would be households instead of people because it was the households that were surveyed. Also, it doesn't represent households in other countries because the sample was taken only from households in the United States. 
Another point here would be this sample would only represent households with televisions in the United States. Because in this case, if a household didn't have a television, it would not have been included in the survey. Another example. A newspaper article reports that the president's approval rating is 33% according to a Gallup poll of 1,022 adults in the United States. The sample here is all of the 1,022 adults surveyed, not just the 33%. And the population represented by the survey is all adults in the United States. Notice that the survey does not represent all people in the United States because children were not included in the sample. Also, it doesn't represent adults in other countries since the sample only included adults in the United States. Here's a question for you to test yourself. According to a newspaper report, 70% of teenagers in Cheyenne have tried alcohol at least once. This information is the result of a survey of 200 Cheyenne High School students. The question is, what population does the survey actually represent? Is it teenagers? Is it high school students in Cheyenne? Is it teenagers in Cheyenne? Or is it the 200 students that were surveyed? You can pause the video at this point if you'd like while you think about what the answer would be. The correct answer for this is that the population represented is high school students in Cheyenne. In the question, the newspaper report claimed that 70% of teenagers in Cheyenne have tried alcohol at least once. But that doesn't fit with where the survey came from. So the newspaper report wasn't exactly accurate. The survey was only done among Cheyenne High School students. So that would be the population represented. So the correct answer is high school students in Cheyenne. Now another question. This is from the same newspaper report and the same survey. The question here is, what is the sample for this survey? Is it the 70% of the 200 students that were surveyed? Is it 70% of high school students in Cheyenne? Is it high school students in Cheyenne? Or is it the 200 students that were surveyed? Again, you can pause the video now if you'd like to give yourself time to think about the correct answer. The correct answer for this question would be the 200 students that were surveyed. The sample has to be everyone that was actually surveyed. So that would be the 200 high school students. Section 2 is about statistical thinking. And here we're talking about what you need to do if you're looking at a study or a survey that has already been done. Some factors to consider when you're looking at the results of a survey or a study. So several things to think about here. One is the context of the data. Another is the source of the data. The sampling method. The conclusions. And practical implications. First of all, the context of the data. We want to think about where does the data come from? What do the values in the data represent? And why was the data collected in the first place? Next, the source of the data. Is the source objective or is the source biased? That's something very important to think about. Is or was there some incentive to distort or spin results to support some self-serving position? In other words, for whoever was during the survey or the study, did they have a reason to possibly misrepresent the results? Did they have something to gain or to lose by distorting or misrepresenting the results? So the key here is to be vigilant and very skeptical of studies from sources that may be biased. Another thing to look at is the sampling method. And we'll talk much more about sampling methods in a later chapter. So for right now, the main thing to be aware of is the high likelihood of bias if a voluntary response sample is used. A voluntary response sample is something where the respondents choose whether to respond or not. And we'll talk more about that 
in sections 1.4 and 1.5 in this chapter. Finally, we want to look at the conclusions of the study or the survey. A correlation is an association between two variables. Causality is a conclusion that one of the variables or factors causes the other variable or factor to occur. And correlation does not imply causality. In other words, two variables can be associated or related. That doesn't necessarily mean that one factor caused the other to occur. Now there is a section in your textbook about practical implications. We won't cover this topic in this course but feel free to read about it if you want to. Let's go on to section 1.3 about types of data. A few definitions. A parameter is some kind of numerical measurement describing some char characteristic of a population. So population and a parameter go together. Now when we talk about a statistic, a statistic is a numerical measurement describing some characteristic of a sample. Sample and statistic go together. Notice that population and parameters both started with P. Sample and statistic both start with S. Here's an example. When Lincoln was first elected to the presidency, he received 39.82% of the 1,865,908 votes cast. So the question is, would we be talking about a population and a parameter here, or a sample and a statistic? Because we were talking about all the votes that were cast, we could consider that to be a population. And in that case, the 39.82% is a parameter. Now, suppose that an exit poll of 1,000 voters had been conducted for the election. Now, when we're looking at the 1,000 voters, that would be a sample. And that means that the 35% would be a statistic. Now when we talk about data, we have several different ways to describe the types of data that we're talking about. First, we're going to talk about separating data into two large classes. This is quantitative data and qualitative data. So when we talk about quantitative data, quantitative has to do with quantities. So we're talking about numbers, that represent counts or measurements. For example, the weights of patients in a study. Another example, the number of points earned or the percentage score on an assignment. The other type of data is qualitative. You can also think of qualitative data as being categorical, in other words, divided into just categories or attributes something like male or female, tall or short. The qualitative data can be separated into different categories distinguished by some specific characteristic. This characteristic may or may not be a numerical value, whereas with quantitative data, you have to have a numerical value. For example, the genders, male, female, of professional athletes would be qualitative data. Another example would be rankings of anything. For example, rankings of college football teams. Even though the rankings would be numerical, it still qualifies as qualitative data. And the reason that we think about whether something is quantitative or qualitative data is because we do different things with quantitative data than we do with qualitative data. And when we're working with quantitative data, we also can divide it into two types. We can have discrete quantitative data or continuous quantitative data. We get discrete data when the number of possible values for the data is either a finite number or a, what we call a countable number. In other words, it's something that you could count. For example, if we had something like the number of children at McCormick Junior High, we could sit down and count them. The number of possible values would be anything from zero up to whatever upper limit you want to set. Here's some more examples of discrete data. If we survey a car dealership and find out that they sold 89 cars last month, we can count the number of cars that they sold. That makes it discrete data. Or if we talk about the number of students enrolled at LCCC each semester, that's something that we could count. Another example of discrete data 
would be a year, for example, the year that I graduated from high school. This is a number, and we wouldn't necessarily be thinking about counting, but if you wanted to, you could count years. Now, when we talk about continuous data, this is different from discrete data in that it includes infinitely many possible values. These are on some continuous scale. In other words, they cover a whole range of values that doesn't have any gaps or interruptions or jumps. When we were talking about discrete data, when we talk about things like counting students, there's a gap between one student and two students. So we're not including numbers like 1.5 or 1.33. So there are gaps in those values. Continuous data doesn't have those type of gaps. Anything that's a measured value, for example, a height, a weight, a temperature, or a time interval, that's always going to be continuous data. Because if you're measuring something, the actual height or the actual weight could be anything within a whole range of values. Here's an example. If we look at the actual contents in ounces of cola in a Coke can labeled 12 ounces, that would be a continuous data set. Because the actual contents could be anything between zero and the maximum amount that a can will hold. No matter how we measure it, the actual amount of cola in there could be something like 11 ounces, it could be 11.984 ounces, it could be 12 ounces, it could be any other value. Here are some more examples of continuous data. The amount of time it takes each student in this course to complete the first exam. When we're talking about an amount of time, that could be anything from zero minutes up to the limit on the time to take the test, which would be two hours. If we look at the height of a three-year-old elm tree, the height could be anything from zero inches up to however tall an elm tree can get. Or if we look at the weights of 59 babies born at UMC last month. And here notice that the weights, because they are a measurement, would be continuous data, but the number of babies born last month would be discrete data because it's something that we can count. We also have another way to classify data. This is called levels of measurement. And we can define four levels of measurement, two for qualitative data and two for quantitative data. So qualitative data, we can divide into nominal and ordinal. Quantitative data, we can divide into interval and ratio. So nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio are the four levels of measurement. First, when we talk about the nominal level of measurement, nominal means name. This type of data consists of names, labels, or categories. And it's something where the data can't be arranged in a meaningful ordering scheme, such as low to high, poor to excellent, and so on. When we talk about nominal data, we can usually put our data into alphabetical order, but we don't count that as a meaningful ordering scheme. So for example, nominal data would be survey responses such as yes, no, undecided. We really can't put that into an order that makes any difference. The next level of measurement is the ordinal level of measurement. And ordinal means that it does have some type of order. So this is still categorical data, but it can be arranged in some type of, type of meaningful order. For example, low to high, poor to excellent, rankings, things like that. If the data is numerical, then the differences between data values either can't be determined or they're meaningless. Here's an example. If we look at final course grades, such as A, B, C, D, or F. For one thing, this is not numerical which tells us that it's qualitative data, but we can arrange it in an order. Obviously, a grade of A is better than a grade of C. So we can tell which grade is better and which grade is not as good. Another example, responses to a survey question where respondents answered on a scale from one for strongly disagree to seven for strongly agree. Now, this would be something where we could put the responses in an order that would make some sense, and we would actually have numerical values, 
but this still counts as qualitative data because we can't give a numerical difference between a 1 and a 2. We can rank them, but we can't really tell the difference between those two. Now let's go on to the two level, levels of measurement for quantitative data. The first is the interval level. So for the interval level of measurement, we have to have numerical quantitative data. And we also have to have numerical data where the difference between two data values can be determined and does have a meaning. However, for the interval level of measurement, there's no natural zero starting point. In other words, there's no point where none of the quantity is present. Also in this case, ratios of values don't make sense. So if we have two data values and we divide one by the other, that doesn't give us an answer that makes any sense. Here's an example. Time, for example, the years 1000, 2000, 1776, and 1492. We can calculate the difference between any two of these years, and it makes sense. The difference between 1492 and 1776 is 284 years, and this does tell us something. However, we don't have a year zero that represents no time, so there's no natural zero starting point. And also, if we take a ratio of two of these years, if we divide one by the other, for example, if we divide 1776 by 1492, that doesn't tell us anything, so that has no meaning. Now the final level of measurement is the ratio level. This is quantitative again, and it's like the interval level, only it has some additional properties. There is a natural zero starting point for the ratio level, and the reason that we call it the ratio level is that ratios do have a meaning. Here's an example. If you look at prices of college textbooks, zero dollars would be a natural zero starting point. This represents no cost. Also, if you looked at two textbooks, if you had one that cost $50 and one that cost $25, if you look at the ratio of these two numbers, 50 divided by 25, that's two, and that does have a meaning because it means that the $50 textbook costs twice as much as the $25 textbook. So here's a summary of our levels of measurement. If we're trying to figure out what level of measurement something is, first we can usually determine whether it's qualitative or quantitative data. If we determine that it's qualitative data, then we know it has to be either nominal or ordinal. Nominal, remember, means categories only with no order. Ordinal means categories with some meaningful ordering scheme. Now if we decide that the data is quantitative, then our two possibilities are either interval or ratio. For the interval level, we can find meaningful differences between two values, but there's no natural zero starting point, and ratios don't make sense. If it's at the ratio level, then differences make sense, there is a natural zero starting point, and ratios also make sense. Let's look at some examples for this. Here are some rankings from 2008 for the top party schools in the United States. So we have all the way from number one, the University of Florida, down to number 10, Florida State University. So the question is, what type of data would this be? If we look at the ranking numbers, those are numerical, so the first question would be, does this actually count as qualitative data or is it quantitative data? So if we're trying to figure out the level of measurement for the rankings, that would be the first question to ask. Is it qualitative or quantitative? In this one, it might be a little hard to tell. So let's go on to the next question and come back to that one. Are the differences between the rankings meaningful? In other words, can we tell how close the number one and the number two schools were? Do we have any other information besides just the rankings? And the answer to that is no. If we had actual, if we had actual numbers of students, 
that ranked those two schools number one and number two, then we could tell how far apart the number one and number two schools were. But we don't have that information. So what does that tell us? Remember, if we're looking at ordinal data, we can put the values in order, but the differences between the values aren't meaningful. So if the differences aren't meaningful, that means that this is most likely going to be ordinal data. And that tells us the answer up here, because remember, ordinal data was qualitative. So now, just to check that we really have ordinal data, can we arrange this in order? Well, yes, we can. It's already arranged in order, actually, from 1 to 2, to 3 to 4. So yes, we can. It already is. And that just verifies the answer that we got for this question, that we have ordinal data. So this would be the ordinal level of measurement. Here's another example. If we look at plant maturity, if you're planting a garden, for example, different varieties of carrots have different maturity times which is given as the expected number of days for the plant to mature. So here are some varieties of carrots and the expected days to maturity for each. So we have three varieties listed here. Nancy's half long is 70 days. Tushan is 65 days. And the Sugar Snacks Hybrid is 68 days. So first, let's look at the level of measurement for the variety names. So again, our first question is going to be, what type of data is this? Is it qualitative or quantitative data? Well, this one's fairly easy to figure out. This would be qualitative data because it is just names. Now, since it's qualitative data, that means it's either going to be nominal or ordinal level of measurement. So to tell the difference between those two, we need to know whether we can arrange the names in an order that's meaningful. Well, the only order that we could arrange these in would be alphabetical. And remember, alphabetical doesn't count as a meaningful order. So the answer to that is no. Well, if it's qualitative data and we can't arrange it in a meaningful order, then it means it's the nominal level of measurement. And remember, nominal meant name. And this is names only. So that makes sense. Now let's look at the level of measurement for the days to maturity. So we're looking at these values here. Again, our first question is, is this qualitative or quantitative data? Since we're talking about a number of days, this would be quantitative. If it's quantitative data, then we're trying to decide between the interval or the ratio level of measurement. So one question we can ask is, is there a natural zero starting point? Since we're talking about a number of days, then zero days would be a natural zero starting point. So the answer to this is yes, there is a natural zero starting point. And would ratios be meaningful here? Um, for example, if we had, say, 100 days versus 20 days, 100 divided by 20 would be 5. And that would have a meaning. That would mean that the 100-day one would take five times as long to mature as the 20-day one. So the answer to this is yes, ratios would be meaningful. And that means that we have the ratio level of measurement. 